Good morning, Bowie City Church. Hopefully you enjoyed that video in the worship. If, did y'all see what he made? He made a, pulp, a pulpit, a podium. You're like, what did he make? A um, little fixer-upper there. We're glad you are here this morning. Uh, as Jason said, we had Bowie Fest yesterday, which was great. It was awesome. We had 140 plus people that actually took time and put their vote or put their mark on the board of where they think they need fixing up. Uh, and uh, one story that was really funny, uh, it was between uh, Janet Johnson and Elizabeth and myself. This, uh, she was an older lady came and she was like, what you guys doing? And we were explaining it to her. And uh, we're asking her, what area of your life would you think you need a little, little fixing up, a little work? And she's like, she's, she's looking at the board. She's like, so it's, it's, no. The attic, and we had the bedroom and living room, and we had the kitchen, and we had the office and study. She looks at the attic. She's like, "Attic, uh, hidden secret." She's like, "I ain't got no secrets. Everybody know my business. Like, I ain't got nothing to hide." We're like, "Okay, or right, this is gonna be an interesting conversation." She's like, "I ain't got nothing to hide." And then she goes to the next one. She's like, "Office career, well, done with that." And she looked at the she looked at the other one, living room, and she's like, "Oh, my relationships are good." She looked at health. She's like, "I'ma pick my health." She's like, "I always need to work on my health." We're like, "Oh, that's a good one." So she explained why. And then she's like, but the bedroom too. She's like, but that's with my husband. She's like, I've been married 20 something years. She's like, I'm too tired to do anything more with my husband. I tell him, you sit over there and you're good. And I'm gonna sit over here. We just look at each other and just be happy. Just be glad we made it this far. And we're like, oh, really? She's like, oh, I ain't got no more time for him. Like, uh, we're good. We made it this far. You sit there and we just, we're, we're happy. We're like, well, if you're both on the same page with that, then y'all good. She's like, well, y'all be blessed. And she kept on moving. We're like, that was fun. That was interesting. She's like, you just look over there. You just look at me. And, that's it. We're good. We're good. Fixer Upper. Fixer Upper. Why did we choose Fixer Upper to, to work on, to use as a, as a, a series title? Well, if you watch any HGTV, uh, you know there's a show called Fixer Upper. It's probably one of the most popular shows on there. And if you don't know about that show, it is about uh, a couple, this adorable couple who, you know, the husband can't do no wrong. And all the wives are like, why aren't you more like Chip? But uh, they, take, they take the worst house. They say they take the worst house in the neighborhood and they make it into the best home. And so that's what they do. They're in Waco, Texas, and they just take houses and they make them their dream homes for their clients. And so it's called Fixer Upper. We all need some fixing up in our life. Some of us, when it comes to fixing up the areas in our life, some of it just needs like just a fresh cleaning kind of deal. Some of us just need to like a fresh coat of paint. We just need to like just rearrange things, just get things, you know, just ready, just, just different, just, just upgrade it just a little bit. That's some of our fixer up. For some of us, we need like the full overhaul, like rip everything out, like down to the foundation, to the studs and rebuild it. You might even need to hire some professional help to help you get to where you need to go, where you need the area in your life, you need some fixing up. That is what we're talking about. And so as Jason said, we had five topics on the board and we're gonna be preaching through those five topics this month of June. Uh, and so if you miss one, that's okay. They're gonna be online, they're gonna be on YouTube and on, on a, our, our Facebook page and also on our website if you miss one of them, but because we want everybody to have in every area of your life be fixed the way God wants it to be, to operate the way God has uh, designed it to operate, to be at your max of living the way God has called you to live. So today we get to talk about one of the topics, and I want to start off with the story. This husband goes to his wife, and he knows her birthday is coming, and so he asks his wife, what would you like for your birthday? And she looks at him, she says, I just wish I was 10 again. He says, okay, got it. And so they go, uh, he plans this perfect day for her, so he wakes her up early, and he's like, I'm going to I'm going to knock it out of the park. So he gets her corn puffs and he gets her uh, pop tarts and he's like, here's your breakfast. And she's like, okay. Uh, so she eats the breakfast and he's like, all right, now we're going to go to, uh, we're going to Six Flags. I, I well, got us, the passes at Six Flags. We're going to skip the lines, we get to the front of the line. And she's like, okay, she's down. So they do all the roller coasters and all the rides. They're screaming and eating all the amusement park food. And she's like, my head is hurting and my stomach's turning, but that was, that was fun and enjoyable. He's like, oh, we're not done yet. We're going to go to the water park. So they walk across the park. He brought her a bathing suit and they did the slides and she got sunburned, but she was like, this was a good, good time. And she's like, thought her day was done. He's like, oh, we're not done yet. Now we're going to 
go to the movies. And so he took her to the movies, go to see the new Lion King movie. Y'all know live action. Y'all know how I feel about Disney and Lion King. So he takes her to, to that. They get popcorn and snacks and sodas. And she's like, okay, uh, that was good. I like the movie. Are we done? And he's like, no, no, no. Now we're going to go to Dave and Buster's. And he's like, go to Dave and Buster's. We're going to eat some food and play video games. She's like, okay, well, so we do that. And he's like feeling awesome about herself. I accomplished a 10-year-old day. He's like, so how did you enjoy your birthday? How did you enjoy being 10? She's like, well, I actually said, I can't wait to be a size 10 again. <laughs> size, and he's like, oh, he, he missed it. He missed it. A lot of times we go with the flow. We go with the good intentions. Like, you know, it means well, and we're going to just go with the flow. But this is not ideal. This is not what I really had in mind. Like, that is kind of happens in our lives. We really are just going with the flow. It's not the ideal situation. Things aren't quite right. Things are not the way you think they should be, but you just go with it. You go with it, and eventually you get to a point where you're like, things are just broken. Like, this is just not going to work. If a husband can't, doesn't clearly hear his wife often enough, eventually there's going to be some tension. Eventually there's going to be some strife. We need to do a little fixer up in our lives, and today we get to look at marriage. We get to focus on husband and wives. You're like, if you're single or if you're, you're not, you know, you're a teenager, you're a student, you're like, I ain't got to marry, I'm not married, I don't have a husband or wife. Don't tune out because this still involves you and how you to carry yourself and how we are to attract somebody and how we are to love somebody once we are in a loving relationship, uh, especially if it's a marriage relationship. So stay tuned in because we're talking about fixing marriage. Everyone say fixing marriage. We are talking about fixing marriage, and I read this article from Outreach Magazine. It says this, that 52% of Americans say they believe the Bible is God's authoritative word. 52% of Americans, so about half, say the Bible is actually God's authoritative word. So about half the country. So, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. 45% of that same number mix God's commands with their opinions. So that same 52%, 45 of that group, all half of that group says, I take God's word and I take how I feel about it in my opinion, and then that's how I apply it. Okay, that's not quite right, but that's how that goes. And then 32% of it says that they should actually live by the God's word. 36% actually say we should live by it. So it's half the country thinks it's God's, uh, it's his orth, 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 orth his authority, his word, <laughs> God, good grief. And then 36% say, but we should, you should live by it. Only about a third say you actually should live by it. And then from that, they say, I take, take God's word and I put my opinion upon it, and that's how I live. And then 15% say they actually ignore God's word when it comes to a conflict of their plans. 15% say, if it goes against what I want to do, I just ignore it. I don't, I don't do anything with it. Why is this important to know? Because God's word states something that we don't like, our culture says that is obsolete. If God's word says something that we don't like what it says, it rubs against us, our culture, our culture will say, oh, the Bible's obsolete. We need to like update. It's 2019. When we face a dilemma, will we believe and obey God's leadership and his word and trust in him, or will we say it's obsolete? When it comes to fixing marriages and doing marriage God's way, the way he is designed it to be, this topic gets kind of tough. Doing marriage God's way isn't easy. When I marry couples and I tell them, and I say this in a ceremony, like marriage should not be walked into lightly. Like this is not something like, like just put a ring on it kind of deal. It's not a, it's not a song. Like this is the hardest relationship you're ever going to have on earth is the person that you're marrying. Should not be entered into lightly. Look, two, peop two imperfect people are taking vows in hopes to have the perfect marriage. And I want to tell everyone out there, the perfect marriage does not exist. And you want to know why? I know the answer. You've been asking that. The reason why the perfect marriage doesn't exist is because you are a part of the marriage. The other person could be perfect, but once you're in the picture, uh, it's wrong. It's, it's not going to work the way it's designed to work. Two imperfect people are trying to work on this perfect union. And it doesn't come out that way. There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Problems happen. Things come up. How we are to make this to, how we are to make this work? How are we are to fix our marriages? So if you're currently married or if you're not, 
but you desire to have a successful marriage, you desire to have marriages around you that are healthy, that are vibrant, that are full of God's love and full of his grace, no matter what the circumstances that you're facing, it's important to know the God's way of marriage. It is important to always, and I mean always, fix and work on your marriage, to work on your dating relationships, to view the person that God has for you. Is this the person for me? And if it is, how do I live with this person the way God has called me to live? So we're going to fix some marriages today. We're going to fix some relationships that are heading towards marriage. We're going to fix our, how we view marriage. And so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 32. God's call to wives, okay? It starts with, it starts with wives, all right? So wives, if, if you're going to be a wife or you are a wife, this is to you. This is God's word to you. This is what it says. It says, wives, that's, hey, all the females, it says this, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Ooh, okay, we'll get, we'll, we'll get back to that. For your husband is the head of the, of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. You're like, Dion, I don't really like that. I don't, I don't like how that sounded. I don't, like, I'm not cool with that. We, 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 we got to break it down. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to break down what, the, what this is talking about. So the appeal of submission. The appeal of submission. Verse 22 to 23. A nervous bride walks down the aisles, walking down the center aisle as she prepares for her marriage, and they're doing their rehearsal. And she, as she's walking down, she's messing it up. She's getting off rhythm. She's, she's like stopping and going. And the pastor's like, what is going on with her? What is, what is going on? So he's like, everyone stop. And he tells the bride, hey, come, hey, let's, let's come to the side. Let's, let's talk a little bit. And he's like, what's, what's, what's wrong? She's like, I'm just, I'm just nervous. I'm just like, I'm nervous about the whole day and they're getting married. And he's like, okay, look. When you come into the church tomorrow, you're going to walk down that center aisle that you have done since you've been a little girl. So when you get here and you get to this point, just focus on the aisle. Just, just focus on that. You know it. You've done it. You know it. He's like, okay, when you get a little bit further, you're going to see the altar. Just focus on the altar. You've seen it. You know what it means, what it represents, that, you're, that the altar is there to sacrifice, to give to God. Just focus on the altar. And then you can take your eyes and focus on your fiance, your soon-to-be husband, Jim. Just focus on him. Just, just put your eyes on him, and you'll make it through. And so the wedding came, and she's, she's, she's getting ready, and she's, she does what she's supposed to do, and she feels great about it. Like, it's going well. And as she's walking down the aisle, all the people can, are a little shocked and a little like, what is going on? Because all the way down the aisle, she says, I'll alter Jim. I'll alter Jim. I'll alter Jim. They're like, I don't know if she really altered Jim or not. I don't know. She's just trying to get down the aisle. But sometimes we go into marriage thinking, I'm going to change him. I'll alter him. I'm going to tweak him a little bit. I'm going to get him right. I don't know if that really happens or not. I doubt it. But Paul here says the key for every wife that, that wants the hope of influencing for the hope of doing her part for their marriage to be successful has to be to submit. And it's like, that is heavy, but what does that mean? So the word submit, the word here in verse 21, means to relinquish one's rights and to fall in line by willingly placing oneself under another's authority and care. I'll give the definition again. Submit means to relinquish one's right and to fall in line willingly placing oneself under the authority and care. This word submit is often used in the military when it comes to an officer and those that they command. That a soldier will willingly place themselves under the authority of their commanding officer and under their care. This is what God is saying. What he's saying to wives. So the emphasis is on the wife who is willingly, again, willingly, not forcefully, but willingly placing herself under her husband's authority and care, under his leadership. She falls in line under his love. It's voluntary response to God's call and God's will for the role of a wife. 
to give up her independence, to give up her rights and say, I fall under the, your leadership. I fall under the authority. I'll come under your care. So I want everyone to understand this. Submission is not obedience. Submission isn't obedience. Just want to be clear here. A wife is not to be commanded to obey her husband. Okay? Amen. No, I'm not. Yeah, they're not the boss of me. Uh, that is not what it is. It's you're, you're not to approach your wives. Husbands are not to approach their wives as you approach your children. So wives and husbands are equal, co-equals. They're co in this family. They're together. They are equal. Children are not equal. And then sometimes that gets out of whack. That's another thing that you know, we might need to fix. We're not talking about parenting. But children are not equal to the husband and wife. They're equal in human and they're people and like, yes, like you should feed them and stuff like that. But they're not <laughs> equal. They don't have the, they, their, their decision doesn't weigh the same. What they would like to do doesn't trump what the parents have to do and their love. They're not equal in that. You love your children to death. You would do anything for them, but eventually you are training your children to leave, and it's just going to be you and your wife, you and your husband. So you're not married to your children. You're married to them, married to the person you said I do to. You didn't say I do to your kids. I remember telling our kids that. like, I love your mom more than I love you, and she loves me more than she loves you. They're like, yeah, right, Dad. Mom, do you love me more than Dad? She's like, nope. They're like, Mom. (laughs) And she's like, "I'm, I'm not married to you. I'm married to... Dad, for the rest of my life, you can get to go away and move away. I still got to be with him. I better love him. They're like, oh, okay, I, I kind of get it. But they, at first they were like, I am offended that you don't love me more than dad. It's co. It is equal. And wives are, should willingly, who longed willingly to place themselves under the husband's leadership. See, the husband is to love their wife. The husband is to love that bride that she is and to cherish her and to respect her and to adore her. Can you imagine Jesus, who is the groom to the church, ever talking bad about his bride? Can you ever imagine Jesus not cherishing the church? Can you ever imagine Jesus not respecting the church? That is what we are to do as husbands and wives as the church comes under Jesus' authority. The the wife is to do that and to long for that and want to be in that position because that's how God has designed it. Nevertheless, a wife is to fall under, under the leadership of God and fall under, as the husband falls, the leadership of the husband where the wife wants to fall under the leadership of God. The wife, as I want to follow God, and as my husband follows God, I want to follow under my husband. That is the call to the wife. But this is not easy. Unfortunately, that's not the natural inclination of a woman or of anyone. It takes a supernatural move of God for that to work the way God has designed it. And what am I referring to? Referring to Genesis 3, you can turn there if you want. You don't have to. But Genesis 3, God's created the heavens and earth in chapter 1 and 2 and talks about that. And then in Genesis 3, the fall happens. And in Genesis 3.15, we have the first, first mention of Jesus where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. You shall bruise him on the hill and he shall strike you on the head. That is talking about Jesus. That's the right there. But we're going to talk about verse 16. Genesis 3, 16, and this is God talking to Eve. This is God talking to Eve. Now, before we get there, before I say it, let me just backtrack. Let me just tell you how we got to this point. So Eve was deceived by the serpent, by Satan. He was the serpent. He, he, this whole other story, or we're not going to really get, but she was deceived. And so she ate from the tree of good and knowledge, uh, knowledge of good and evil, and she ate it, and then she gave it to her husband, Adam, to eat, and he ate it. And Adam would, couldn't throw her on the bus. He tried, but he's like, you were there too, and I told you not to eat from it. He's like, the woman you gave me. He's like, don't you put, on, put that on me, Ricky Bobby. Like, I told both of you not to eat from that. And so because of that, God had made the first clothing line, the uh, Marnie and Leaf and, uh, and, and, and fur clothing line. So God had to um, make a sacrifice for their sin because blood is required to cover our sin. First sacrifice happens. Understand the gospel is right there. In Genesis 3, where God says, I have to make this right. 
The only way sin can be covered is through blood. And that's how Jesus died for, that is why he died for the world, covered the, our sins with his blood. So the first sacrifice happens, and then God tells them this. God curses them. Woo, God sends, I, I believe in God, like, like, buddy, love God. Like, I believe, like, God loves me. He sends me blessings. Well, if he's not blessing you, then you're going to curse. Like, it's just, so he curses man, he curses the woman, and he curses the serpent. And he says this to the woman, the curse that he placed upon her, says this in Genesis 3.16. Now the Lord said to Eve, I will increase your pain and labor when you give birth. You're like, thanks, Eve. You're awesome. <laughs> like, thank you for that. I enjoy that so much. Not quite. Not quite. So he increased a labor pain. There was already some labor pain, but he says, I'm going to increase it, which is what we have today. And you will desire your husband's authority but he will rule over you. And these are different words where we're talking about submission and authority and coming under. Like authority is different from, from rule. And so the tension is now in their relationship. See, before the fall, Eve lived under the authority and the responsibility of Adam, and it was all good. Like there was no problem. She was, Adam was doing her thing and she was like, just look at him. Mm, I can, I just love him. Look at him over there controlling stuff and doing stuff. I just love it. Like, oh, Adam, mm, like give me tingles. Like she was like all like all about it. She wasn't trying to step on Adam's toes. She wasn't trying to like buck him and his authority. She was just all about it. And then once they understood good and evil and understand what like, she was like, hold up. Why he doing like that? Like, how come he didn't, oh, why are we going this way? Like, I thought, how come I, we are on the same page? Like, and, she, it, and it goes left. Before the fall, there was none of that. It was perfect. It's the way God had designed it. See, she desired his position. She desired it. That word desire is in Aramaic. means to seek control or to compel. So the curse on Eve was the woman's desire before that time would to be have the place of man's headship. She's like, how come you the boss? How come he how come he has the authority? How come I have to come under him? How come not not saying that directly to Adam, but in her nature, she's saying that to God. Like, what? Why do I have to? God said, like, This is how I've designed it. As the man comes under me, the woman comes under, and that's the perfect harmony and unity. This is the way I've designed it to be. But that desire of taking his place is there. The desire to push back is there. And it may not be the woman's desire to fall under the authority of, the, of her husband's love, but if her spiritual calling unto God is to submit as unto the Lord. She may have you, as a wife, you might have a problem coming to the authority of your husband for all these different reasons, but if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, you call yourself a Christian, then and you place your son under God's authority, you are to do the same for your husband. That is the call of a wife. So now the attitude of submission. We have the appeal of submission and now the, the attitude of submission. A wife is to submit to her husband's leadership as she submits to God's spirit. Now here's the important reality. A wife who refuses to submit to God's call on her, to submit to her husband, chooses to live in disobedience to God's will. I'm going to say it one more time. A wife who refuses to, to submit to God's calling on her life as a wife to submit to her husband, chooses to live in disobedience to God's will. It's God's will for you to do that. It's God's will for you to fulfill that role as a wife. The marriage will suffer, even if the husband is loving his wife the way God has called him to. It will be very difficult. It will be very hard. And it will be very hard for a husband who is not doing, loving his wife the way God's called him, even though the wife is in full submission the way God has called her to love. It's going to be very, very difficult. Now we have the mission of submission. The ambition of submission. So let me ask you a question. Is there any area in your life that you are to withhold from Christ? Is there any area in your life where you're like, God, that is not for you, that is for me. Is that the way it's supposed to be? No, it's not. We are to give our whole lives unto God. The ambition of a wife is to 
to be identical to the response of every Christian to Christ, to completely surrender and unite to the headship, not to fight it, not to buck it, but to be united in that. And I think there's an even higher calling for wives, a wife who submits to her husband as, the follow, as she follows the Lord in the same footsteps of her Savior. A wife's attitude should be the same as Jesus who surrendered himself, who, who surrendered himself unto God and God's will of, of the Father and humbled himself and gave his life for us and gave, gave his life for our sins and for, for forgiveness. As Jesus said, not my will be done, Lord, but your will be done, submitted to the Father's will and ch- chose a cross, that is the submission that God is calling wives to. He's calling all of us to it. But as a role, as a wife, that's what he's calling us to. And you're like, that's hardcore. Like, come on now. Like, really? Like, God, like, Jesus didn't want to die. He didn't want to suffer on the cross. He didn't want to go through all that pain. Like, his human nature was like, avoid pain. Like, no one's like, ooh, pain. Run to it. Sign me up for more pain. Like, he's like, oh, God, if there are any other way. But he said, not my will be done. Your will. I submit to your authority, Lord. That's what God is calling wives. That's what it looks like. And when a wife submits to God and to her husband, she experiences a fulfillment that only can, can, that can come no other way. And the result would be an environment of intimacy, growth, and ministry partner that will make a difference in the home and in their work and in her life. When things are right, like, it's just, it's working. Like, I feel there's a sense of fulfillment that a wife will have that only can happen when they fall in line the way God has called us to submit to him and the way God has called us to submit to each other. That's the call of the wife. All right, now I'm going to go off the wife. I'm going to get on the husband. She's like, good, go on the husband. The call of the husband. It's like, I got it. Like, now we let's talk about him now. Like, what, what did it say about him? The call of a husband, a call to a husband. It says this in Ephesians 5, 25 and 30. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. And in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He is to love his wife as he loves himself. After all, no one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. The splendor of love. Verse 25 talks about the splendor of God's love. And this love that that is here, the definition of love, is the unconditional, continuously love sacrificially. You're like, ooh, that's a lot. I'll just say it again. That love that God has called husbands to do is this unconditionally and continually love sacrificially. Husbands are to love their wives as Jesus loves them. Unconditionally and sacrificially. Love does not do whatever it wants. Love does not do only accomplish their needs. Love does not consider the cost that it will take for me to love that person that way. No. Love is whatever you need, I will give. Unconditionally. It gives without looking for anything in return. Woo, let me say that again. Loving, it says I'm going to love without looking or expecting anything back in return. That's what God's calling the husbands how to love. Because Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And has the church ever been just 100% correct to to, to Christ? No. The church fails Christ time and time and time again. Yet Jesus does not say, I don't love you back because you're not giving me love back. He says, I continue to love you sacrificially. Husbands, it's a heavy, heavy kind of love that we're to give. And it's easy for a woman to fulfill her role when her husband is fulfilling his role. She comes under the authority when you genuinely show her care, when you genuinely show her love. And you're like, Dion, have you met my wife? Have you met the person I'm trying to? Like, she is like cold as a dead fish. Like, I, how am I supposed to love her? Like, what do you, do, bro, like, can we talk? Because do you understand? 
The word, there's a word here, cherish, that we are to cherish her. That word cherish is defined as warming. You are to be warming to your wife. If your wife is dead cold fish, there's a problem, because I gotta ask, are you warming her as, the, as Christ warms the church? Are you being gentle towards her and with her? Are you leading her? Is she, are you a safe place and a soft place to land for her? If not, I know why she's cold. Because you're not warming her. You're not cherishing her. You're not adorning her. You're not, you're not adoring her. You're not doing, you're not presenting her blameless and pure and, and radiant. If you're not doing that, then what do you expect to come back? In marriage, a husband submits to God by loving his wife as Christ loved the church. So if a Christian man, if a Christ-following man, if someone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, is unwilling to love his wife as Christ loved the church, then he's choosing to be disobedient to God's will. Now let me, let me just clarify. To love your wife as Christ loved the church, not the way you want to love your wife. Because sometimes the way you want to love your life, wife is fickle. Sometimes the way you want to love your wife is very selfish. And that's not love. If you're not willing, and you're not pursuing to love your wife as Christ loved the church, you are choosing to be in disobedience to God's will for you as a husband. So how are we to love? How is a husband to love then? You're like, okay, got it. Well, then how am I supposed to love? What does that look like? You're to love like this. The sacrifice of love. That's verse 25 through 27. The sacrifice of love. So we find in this phrasing, in, in these two verses, not only responsibility of loving, but also the measure of the loving. We find not just a responsibility of the love, like it says, but the measure. How are you to do it? As Christ loved the church. See, Jesus loved the church so much that he willingly gave himself up for the church. His entire life for the church. To even die for the church, for the well-being and the welfare of the church. How did Jesus love? He loved us to death. Even death on a cross. Jesus laid down his life for us and gave up his life for us so that we can have life. In the same way, a husband is to lay down his life for his wife. To give his life, to give his wife, his bride, life. Sacrifice. Not your will be done, husband, but the will of the Father through you for the betterment and the benefit of your wife. That's deep kind of love. You're like, all she got to do is do what I say. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. You have to lead the way God's called you to lead, and she was willing to do because she's saying, you're listening to God. I'm following you. Let's go. Let's run. Let's talk about it. How are we going to accomplish this? Let me help you out. Let's get to where God's calling you to get to. But you have to lead the way God has called you to lead. You have to love the way God has called you to love. And then we have the selflessness of love. Selflessness of love. The selflessness of love. What does it mean to love your wife as your own body? What does it mean to love your wife as your own body? It means this. If you're sick, husbands, if you're sick, and then you whine about it, and then you're just whining about it, and then, like, then you go take care of it, you lay down. That's how you're supposed to do it. No, husbands whine way more than wives do when they're sick. You're like, oh, I got a hangnail. She's like, get over it. Like, go, go sit down somewhere. Oh, I got a cough. <laughs> Bruh, take a Tylenol and a, and a Halls. Keep it moving. Like, but if your body is sick, you take care of it. If your body is tired, you lay down. If your body is hungry, you feed it. If your body is thirsty, you give it something to drink. If your body's dirty, you clean it. You may not clean it as soon as the wife will clean it, but you clean your body. I remember when we first got married, I'm doing pre-marriage counseling right now, and I really didn't get this too much with my wife. Uh, I didn't grow up with any women besides my mom, and so I didn't really know this, like, communicating, like, the way women communicate sometimes. And so um, we are sitting on the couch. This is newly married. I don't know a couple months maybe, and we're watching TV, and my wife says, she's like, I'm thirsty. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, literally. And so we're watching, and she's like, oh, I'm so thirsty. And she says it a couple more times. In my head, I'm like, why does she keep saying that? Like, why don't she just get something to drink? And then finally she was like, ah, 
like huff puff and like went and got something to drink. I'm like, what is she mad about? Like, I don't understand. Like, I don't, why is she so mad? And I was like, oh, this verse was like, if I need to treat her, if she thirsts, I need to, sa- <laughs> I got it. But at first I was like, I went to my buddies who were newly married. I'm like, bro, she was all huffing and puffing and I don't understand. And she, she went and got something to drink. Like I was, they're like, bro, you were supposed to get her something. I was. <laughs> like, that's what I was supposed to do? They're like, yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, because I grew up with brothers. Like, you need something to drink. I'm thirsty. I'm going to go get something to drink. I'm like, all right, bet. Go get something to drink. Women don't really communicate that way all the time. And so I was like, oh. And now this verse applies. Oh, I got, I got it. I got it. But it took a while. She would be mad at me for stuff. I'm like, I don't know why she's mad all the time. She, she's mad all the time. I don't understand. My dad's like, you'll get it. You'll understand. Like, you'll, you'll catch on eventually. As my own body has needs and I meet them, when my wife's body has needs, I need to meet them first, sacrificially. Even that means I have to get off off the couch and go do it. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to sacrifice that. I'm happy. I got my butt groove in my couch and seat. Like, I don't want to get up and do. You call my name and like, oh, I just want to stay sitting. I'm like, coming. Like, that's what I want to do. But you sacrifice willingly for your wife willingly. See, the issue here is to give attention to meeting her needs and being concerned to fulfill her needs greater than your own with devotion, with readiness, and with eagerness. And that's hard. Are you always eager to go and meet your wife's need when she meets it? Are you always devoted to do it exactly the way she needs it done for her? No. So unless you're all perfect husbands and you need to be up here and tell us how to do it. That's not the way it happens. I wrote this and I've used this before in weddings. And so I thought it would be really good to, to say it here. So I'm just going to read it word for word what it says here. This is why I charge husbands to this is why in pre-marriage counseling. And sometimes I say this during a ceremony that God has called a husband to represent Jesus by loving his wife unconditionally. To love means the husband must yield his desire and his rights to his wife. He is to lay down his life so that she may be found spotless and holy and blameless. He is to surrender his life so she may be highly esteemed and highly fulfilled. He is to serve her not as his master, but as a servant leader. To treat her with respect and dignity, viewing her as a co-equal to his life, and to what God has called them to do. Placing her first always. The husband, like Jesus, had been called to lead his wife by serving her even unto death, to encourage her, to lift her up, and to protect her. Husbands, it's heavy. I thought the wives was heavy. Husbands, it's heavy. It's heavy on both sides. The call of the couple the call to the couple, the call to the, to the two of you. It says this. This is verse 31 to 33. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and they will be united with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And this is profound mystery, and I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and a wife must respect her husband. A marriage is more than a husband and a wife. A marriage is about us. It's not me over here and uh, my spouse over here. It's about us together. Two people becoming one. If every person makes their marriage about themselves, their marriage will not work. If the wife makes the marriage about me, about her, it will not work. If the husband makes the marriage about him, it will not work. And it won't work the way God designed it. You will need some fixing up for sure. Marriage is about us together. Two people becoming one. One flesh, as it says in verse 31. To become one couple, you have to do two things. You have to leave and you have to cleave. I know you've heard that before. You have to leave and cleave. What does that mean to leave? To step away from your parents' protection and their influence. It means like cut ties. Like I'm no longer with you. I'm with them. Like mom and dad, I love you, but I'm with them. Like cut ties. That's what it means. Like, and that might be hardcore for some, but that's what it means. To leave 
your nest and to cleave to your wife. And what does cleave mean? It actually just really means to cement. To cement. If I cemented your feet to the floor, you're going to be there for a while. Like it's, it's together, like super glue. Y'all ever put super glue and then you put some on your fingers and, you, and then you get mad because you do this? And you're like, dang it. Like, ah, I need the nail polish. Where's the nail polish remover? Like, I'm trying to get to my wife's because I'm like, I got to, un- this is cement stuck together forever. You're like, oh, great. Forever stuck together. One flesh. You become one. Husbands and wives will leave their parents and to be cemented together. Interpen- interdependent to one another. Together dependent on God. In doing so, they become one spirit, one spiritually, one emotionally, one economy, one socially, one intellectually, and one finally physically. They are one. So they're one in flesh, and they're also one in faith. Marriage is about, marriage is one of four institutions God has made. God has made four institutions. One, first one, marriage. He instituted, he made it, designed it. The second is family. Instituted and designed it. This is how family to work. Third is salvation. And fourth is his church. Those are the four things, institutions, that God has made and designed for us to operate in and to live in. For marriage, for the family, for our salvation, and for the church. And when your marriage is working right, your family works better. And when your family is working better and you understand the salvation that has come before you and is for you, the church works better. That's how it's supposed to be. When a husband or wife obeys and submits to the Father's will, not only experiencing a vibrant marriage, but their marriage serves as a light for Christ. And when a wife submits, it reflects the way Jesus submits to the Father. And when a husband loves is the example of how we are to love in God's love and Jesus' love for us. Both the husband and wife are to be like Jesus to one another and to the world. All of us have areas in our life that need some fixing up. In, in your marriage, some of it might just be, I just need a fresh coat of paint. We were really good. We really, we're, we're humming together. Like we're in harmony. We're in unity. And some of us like, we need to rebuild and we need to redo this. We want to, as a church, give you opportunities to say, ah, this is great, or this is not so great, whatever it may be. I'm going to ask you to spread your business and tell us your personal things. But every marriage needs to be prayed for. Every marriage to come, every marriage that is currently here, needs strength, needs prayer, needs God to be the center. As the praise team come up, we're going to give you opportunity to do that within you as your couple, just as your seat. Because ultimately, this is what it's about. That over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus came down from heaven, God's son. And he says, I am the rescue plan to save mankind from their sins. And he lived the perfect life. And then he died the perfect death. And he had the perfect resurrection to cover your sins. To cover the thing that makes a distant gap between you and God. That separates you and God for eternity. Jesus is the reason for our salvation. And as a church, we get to partake in that. And if you're married or not, it doesn't matter. This is what it's about. It's about who is Jesus to you and knowing that he died for you and that grace is enough. So as we partake in communion as a church and it comes forward, this is how we partake in communion. You're going to get a cup. The cup's going to have juice in it. It's going to have a a, a wafer cracker in it. It's gluten-free. And as you, you take the bread, you take the cup, we don't make it like you have to do it all at one time. You take it and you consume it when you're ready. Because Jesus said this in the light, the night he died, the night before he died, he says, this cup is a symbol of my blood that's going to be shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of what I did for you. And he took the bread and he said the same thing. He broke the bread and said, eat this bread in remembrance of me because my body's going to be broken for you. When you drink of this cup and you eat of this bread, remember what I did for you. Remember how much I love you. Remember I came on the submission of the Father for you. So the, the communion stewards are going to come forward. They're going to pass the cups, pass the trays, take it, consume it when you're ready. And as we are closing in this song, 
you want to take it with your wife, you want to take it with your children, you want to take it by yourself, you want to take it and get, get a little space. You're renewing your covenant with God. You say, God, sign me back up. I'm following you. I'm with you. God, we thank you for how great you are, how much you love us. Thank you for marriage and what it means to us, for those who are, are married, long to be married, those who are recovering from a broken marriage, broken relationships. Lord, draw near. And so like, things do not work unless I'm in the middle of it. And it's because of Jesus that we're able to. Or as we partake in communion, let us renew our covenant with you. Let us, those who don't know you, say, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I need to give my life to you. Speak to us now. Holy Spirit, move and work. In Jesus' name, amen.